This is Defenders TV Podcast, episode 162, where we're talking about Luke Cage, season 2, episode 6, The Basement. You think I'm holding back? Fellow Defenders, welcome to episode 162 of Luke Cage, season 2, episode 6, The Basement. Not The Basement Jacks. They had the perfect opportunity to literally just add a character named Jacks in, and then have The Basement, and then just put Basement Jacks in Par- Harlem's Paradise. But no, no they didn't. Anyway, I'm rambling. I am one of your hosts, Chris. I'm one of your other hosts, Derek. Hi, and rounding out the group, I am your third and final host, John. So, guys, do you understand what I'm doing with the basement jacks? I get it. That would have been brilliant. Got that, yeah. <laughs> Just me then. Okay. Fine. Yeah. Fine. But Basement Jacks isn't a song by Pete Rock and CL Smooth, Chris, so it couldn't have been chosen as an episode title. They all have to be by the same guys. Every episode has been, every future episode will be, so uh, they can't choose Basement Jacks. I, I'm not taking that as an <laughs> answer. No, no, it, it was the perfect opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> nope, nope, can't do that, can't do that. Anyway, I think it's about time to get into this episode. Uh, fellow Defenders, this episode was so exciting that Chris wants to record the next episode today. Uh, he's so excited to see episode seven. So, uh, obviously a good one for everybody. There's a nice beginning, meh, middle, nice end. Right. I was just on a roller coaster. I'm kind of off the high, and then we went down on low, and I got really bored and that should back up to the top of the mountain. And now I'm just on the precipice. I'm like, is it going to keep going higher, or are we going to go wee down to the bottom? And then I'm on a really slow build up again. So I, I, I'm dying to see. What was the e in the middle? Well, let's get into our spoiler-filled discussion to discover that, right? Okay. And also, you wrote an amazing synopsis, and I want our fellow defenders to guess the parts, because you can pretty much read it, even in the synopsis. <laughs> You're just like, oh, yeah, that was that, was that part. Oh, yeah. Anyway, so, gentlemen, I think we should get on with our spoiler-filled discussions of Episode 6, The Basement. Before we do that, if you're only joining us for the very first time, well, welcome. Really great to have you here. Everything you need to know is over on our website at DefendersTVPodcast.com. Uh, follow us, share the love, share the podcast, yada, yada, yada. But do you know what? Well, let's just jump into it because this is some really good details here. So, Derek, do you want to tell us what they gave us with the episode details? Sure, yes. The episode was written by Aida Mashaka Crowell. Uh, we know her because she's been one of the main producers on Luke Cage Season 1. She uh, wrote a number of episodes back in uh, back in Season 1. She did uh, Blowing Up the Spot. Uh, and she's done Can't Front Me this this season. Uh, she's also done a couple of episodes of Jessica Jones. She did Freak Accident and AKA Pork Chop uh, back in Jessica Jones. Uh, but the big announcement for Aida is that she's doing one of our favorite comic book adaptations. Mm-hmm. She's doing Why the Last Man as a showrunner and co-producer for, uh, for FX, who will be producing Why the Last Man, one of the best comic book series. If you haven't read it, go out and buy it. It's a complete series. There's only, I think, 40 issues or so um, of the full story. So uh, go out and read it. It's really, really good. Yeah, and very very cool. That. By the amazing Brian K. Vaughan. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm so happy. And so scared, all at the same time. <laughs> it's it's like Preacher. It was it's yeah. essentially like season one of Preacher all over again. Which is you're taking something I love belovedly. Like I, why the last man is a pinnacle similar to the first chapter, the first arc of Invincible by Kirkman, by Walking Dead by Kirkman. Like they're classics, and you're adapting it for TV. So it's mm-hmm. kind of like. We hope you the best. I think she's got some amazing talent based on this episode, based on everything else we know about her. I think she's going to be able to do it. Just keep your fingers crossed at the same time because you know how TV exec goes. Absolutely. I'm going to use the swear jar and a quote from RuPaul now. Don't f*** it up. Yep. <laughs> uh, who, who directed yeah, the episode was directed by Millicent Shelton. She directed the episode of Runaway. She did uh, Tsunami. Cool. And she also directed an episode of Jessica Jones Season 2, which was The Octopus. 
Yeah, excellent. That was a really, really good one. That's we actually thought Hydra was going to come into that's that. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Uh, she has done some episodes of, uh, of other superhero TV. She's done uh, The Flash and Supergirl. So she's moving on up. Yes. Yes, she is. She is she's moving to real TV now. That's good. Yes. <laughs> uh, Kevin Smith has to talk to about how good she is and how they enjoy doing The Flash and Supergirl. Um, because what they do is, I believe at the beginning of the season, there is some of the directors kind of meet up. Mm-hmm. A lot of that stuff runs like clockwork on the CW. Oh, yeah. I happen to do 2,900 episodes a year, I think. Yeah. It probably needs to be, doesn't it? So he talks about how it is, but you still get the odd bit of directorial kind of jump in and love. Mm-hmm. I loved Tsunami uh, on the Runaways. Yeah. If any of our fellow Avengers haven't tried Runaways, it's very good. similar to Cloak and Dagger, a bit more tweeny if i want to call it that but, okay. but still still vaughn still really good uh just a bit more light a bit more less gritty i wouldn't call cloak and dagger teenage i actually thought it was going to be much more teenagey than it was when it came out i really enjoyed no. it. it was quite runaways yeah okay no I, i'm calling runaways more tweeny than cloak and dagger i get you um but in theory marketed to the same audience mm-hmm. but that's enough of other shows that aren't luke cage john do you want to tell us what they gave us this episode. Sure. After the decapitations and shootout, the streets of Harlem are hot as the Silas desperately scour the neighborhood for Piranha and Luke Cage. Shades and Comanche also go on the offensive to try and find Piranha and Luke before Bushmaster's men. As they wait at Pops for them to return, their conversation turns to prison and their relationship inside. And Comanche proclaiming he believes that Shades should make a play for the crown of Harlem. As Luke and Piranha lay low in an abandoned theatre, Luke asks Piranha to explain everything about his involvement with Mariah. But talk soon moves onto something more personal as the two men talk about their fathers. Despite insisting he will involve the police, Luke instead decides to take Piranha to his father's church for protection. Meanwhile, despite assured past, Mariah Dillard refuses to cooperate with Captain Ridenour as everyone races to connect the dots between Piranha, Mariah, Bushmaster, and the grisly find at the clinic. However, Ridenour soon has a confession thrust upon him from Misty Knight, as she explains her attempt to frame the deceased cockroach. Unsure of whether the police can any longer deliver justice, Misty hands in her badge. With Piranha safe, Luke faces Bushmaster. As the two fight, Luke begins to get the upper hand over his rival until Bushmaster uses some old-school magic to place Luke in mortal danger. Nice. Absolutely, yeah. A nice little puff of dust mm-hmm. into the face and he turns into a statue. Big Excellent. cheater. Well, he's got strategy. Why not? Because he was told beforehand there'd be no cheating in this fight. It's just me and you, mano a mano, duking it out. And then he brings along some magic with him, just like all bad guys do. Is it magic? It's old school magic. It's, it's more dust. earthy, more grounded in the earth, because it's with roots and that kind of stuff. It's just science we haven't discovered yet, Chris. Yeah, Chris. I'm not, I'm, I'm not arguing with you. It was just like... If you do that, just electrocute him. It's so much easier. If you're going to cheat. Cheat properly. I don't think he would have been able to bring the electrical cables out on the bridge, unfortunately. And we did see Luke get uh, <laughs> tried to be electrocuted in a previous episode. It didn't work. It didn't break the skin. So True. I am just have this vision of Bushmaster going, huh, one second, holding up his finger, then taking out a battery, jumper <laughs> yeah, exactly, cables. Like, exactly. That would have uh, severely restricted his movements. Yeah. Yeah. Plus, where would he put the, the clamps? On <laughs> Don't the... even continue that one. Guys, I think we need to get into our bullet points. <laughs> I think it is. Uh, I'm going to take the first one, because why the hell not? Uh-huh. The chase is on. And, guys, in a previous episode, I mentioned how Luke Cage had once had his HQ in a cinema. Yeah. We get a cinema. Yeah, this is absolutely on purpose, wasn't it? This is uh, definitely a reference to his comic book uh, headquarters, which was on the third floor above a cinema. Uh, definitely a place that Luke will seek out. And lo- nice little references to to some early African-American cinema. Uh, on the yep. walls, you see posters for lots of uh, movies that have, that have Af- African-American protagonists uh, in them. So uh, definitely a good place for Luke to be hiding out. Okay, so back to the actual bullet point. Uh, we get... A beautiful opening where Luke and Pran are actually being chased by uh, Sheldon and his gang. I love this scene, this chase, because what we do see is Luke being Luke. 
the hero for hire, like the bodyguard as like property. When they get to the top of that building, the roof, and Luke just picks Piranha up and flings him up onto another three stories, yeah. which I loved, and then proceeds to take out five guys, six guys, um, of uh, Bushmaster's mm-hmm. men. Um, including Sheldon. But the one thing, when we were back, episode two, where he's testing his strength, he could jump a crazy distance up and across. Mm. But then, when he jumps across this building, or t- he tries to jump up on the building, and he essentially just, he doesn't. I was just like, okay, I get what you're trying to do for it. it's drama. It's like, oh, he nearly fell. And then he pulls, like, nearly pulls off the thing. But I was like, but we just know from episode two that he can jump stupidly high and far. I know what you mean, Chris. I definitely called it out in episode two that Luke is able to jump pretty far distances and able to should be able to make this gap. But I think they were selling it a little bit with Piranha's reaction to how big the drop was below them. Like, you know, if you're running along a field and doing the triple jump, it's not as scary for you as it would be if you're about to take that exact same jump over a 40-foot drop. You know, I think that's kind of the way they were selling it. But, but yeah, the fact that he still doesn't completely make the jump he had he lands but one hand grasping onto the ledge is just for a bit of drama uh, that shouldn't really need to have been, to have been there <laughs> what did you guys think of the fight i look mm-hmm. i know it was very short it was very brief but we've had luke unleashing his inner cage he seems to be drawing back in again okay well aside from throwing one guy off the building which i'll take that back actually <laughs> the rest of them he doesn't fully hurt them he doesn't do what he did to cockroach yes it's, he's taken the advice from claire temple um, where he's actually just hitting them over the head to knock them out, which is which is his strength and is his power. And it's nice that he's doing that because he obviously has taken the advice to heart of the woman who left him. So, uh, so it is kind of good to see that he's even in a moment of being seriously under threat by a lot of people where Piranha could, at least could have been shot and killed, which is the person he's protecting. So he is in a moment of stress, but at least he's using his power correctly and not killing people all around him. Yeah, I mean, I kind of think that the... The baddies really kind of need to get a grip because, um, look, guns don't work. <laughs> it's as simple yeah. as that. And it, it's it's one of those things where, you know, why are they just going rushing in? They know this isn't going to happen. So I would have thought, play a little clever, lads. That's why I kind of enjoyed the, the fight or, or the chase in the cinema later on because it was effectively, we need to just get out of here. We've yeah. managed to get Piranha uh, with Luke being distracted on, on his mobile phone, but we now need to just get Piranha out. And effectively, these guys with guns, it's more of a to slow Luke Cage down so we can extract Piranha. Exactly. And that to me felt much more kind of like they were actually thinking about how they need to approach this guy because he is bulletproof. So going in all guns blazing like they did on the first fight on top of the roof, I was just like, well, you know, that's not going to work. Mm-hmm. So what are you doing, lads? Um, and, and why is Sheldon directing them to do that? Otherwise, they really need to just go on the roof with a rocket launcher because that at least might stun him enough. <laughs> or a six barrel shotgun. Yeah, or a six barrel shotgun to knock him off the roof um, so that they can then go after Piranha. But uh, I really liked it. I, I loved Luke and Piranha together. I loved oh, the yeah. continuing joke that Piranha had saying, you're not really getting this uh, hero for hire. Um, <laughs> come on, you know, where's your professionalism? Because Luke's really just going to say he's going to turn him over to the cops. Um, but I like these two together. I really enjoyed them in, uh, you know, hunkered down, laying low uh, from the... Uh, the, the stylers, you know, that are, are kind of going around searching the neighborhood. I kind of like this. I mean, it was very exposition heavy, but I, I like that, you know, Luke was able to kind of bring Piranha out to tell him exactly what he was doing. But I really enjoyed the discussion um, about each other's fathers because, mm-hmm. again, it was interesting getting that connection between Luke and Piranha that you wouldn't expect. And certainly Piranha being... Uh, almost quite sage-like in saying to to Luke, you know, why don't you ultimately go uh, and, and try and reconcile with your dad? Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I suppose with everything that's happened between Luke and Claire Temple, 
um, he's maybe decided that, look, he does need to actually listen. Um, so I, I really enjoyed this. I, I, I like the, the back and forth between these two whilst they were hold, hold up in the cinema. I thought that was a really nice, um, aspect to this. And certainly just the surprise of, um, you know, we get another hell no from uh, Piranha as he looks down at the the chasm between the two buildings. Uh-huh. You know, another misty hell no, and then after he's been saved, just the way he goes, that is dope. Yeah. Um, I, I love the fact that Piranha is like, you know, he's like a comic book fan. This is his hero. He collects. He's got all the memorabilia, and he is just like an excitable kid with his hero and now um, he's in it for real yeah, yeah exactly. exactly so i i really enjoyed this yeah to be honest this chase with the two of them can i just say new favorite character uh, in this show piranha i really enjoyed their interaction i think the two of them are hilarious together uh piranha is just really good fun he's one of my favorite characters in this episode without a doubt and the advice that he actually gives to luke is really good advice he's talking to him from a place of experience where you hear claire say to luke you need to reconcile with your dad because you never know when he's going to be gone Whereas the conversation he's having with Piranha is effectively Piranha had this moment with his father where he shared with him how good he was and how much he'd educated himself to get himself out of the situation he was in. His father paid him no attention. Then when he became successful, his father came back to him and he said no. And Luke said to him, that must have felt great to finally do that. And Piranha goes, no, it wasn't. And it was the last time I saw him. So take those moments that you have with your father and do something good with them. And it's good advice. And we do see Luke go and visit his father later on in the episode and bring Piranha with him. So that's really good. I, I yeah. think they're setting Piranha up as Turk 2.0. Maybe. Because essentially what we've got, Turk is the underside, the dirty connection. I think Piranha is going to end up being the dirty topside connection. A bit more legitimate, but still maybe a little um, scruffy. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. He'll know yeah. that the guy's... I, I don't know. I think he, because he, he has a finger in every pie. That's what we get told. Like, he kind of explains that he's not squeaky clean. He is dirty, but he's legitimate dirty. So I think what we'll get is in Iron Fist, Danny will find out that there's a group of ninja lawyers who are taking down the city <laughs> and he'll need to know about these back end really bad ninja lawyers. Right. Okay. I'm just you saying. You need to explain this, Chris. Like, where the hell did you just pull that out of? Uh, much like most of my crazy uh, theories, uh, straight out <laughs> uh, of my. And then, and then Godzilla comes in, <laughs> and those n- said ninja lawyers attack him <laughs> and save New York. It's not Godzilla. We already have a dragon in Iron Fist. <laughs> Do you not remember? <laughs> this is Godzilla, not a dragon. That's true. <laughs> you could have Mecha Godzilla come in as well. Maybe, maybe. You know, Chris, you've mentioned a few times on the show that you want to be in the writer's room. Don't ever go into <laughs> the writer's room for any of these shows with those ideas. You may break their brain and they can't write episodes as good as this. But one other thing about this main point, about this this point between these two characters, that second fight, forget about that rooftop fight at the beginning of the episode. That was a small fry. That second fight when they capture Piranha and are, and are taking him out, Luke Cage is channeling Batman. That felt like something yeah. out of the Arkham games. It's awesome where he just pops up out of the ground and takes down two guys around him. It's so cool. It goes through a wall to take out another guy. I was looking at my at my PlayStation controller, wanted to press buttons and control Luke Cage beating up these guys. It's cool. Yeah, really good. Really good. This was completely where that was from. I did get a bit of a giggle on the pop-up one. <laughs> where they were running around the side, and you just see this six foot black man <laughs> crouching and then sitting up and grabbing two men. I'm like, oh, come on, they would have seen him. <laughs> As he said, he's a six foot black man that wears a hoodie. I enjoy it for what it is. I actually did love the jump at the end. Yeah. Where he's two stories up. He takes down the biggest of the guys by, I, I love, which we thought would, would be a standard. Bo- rope a dope box where he kind of does a bit of left and forth and then has to go after him. No, he just looks down, knows, okay, I'm, I'm two stories up. If mm-hmm. I jump on him, crack him on the side of the head, he's going to crumble. And he does that. I like that they are exploring more of his powers now. Exactly, exactly. You need to. We're two seasons in, you know, and we need to really show off some other things that Luke can do with his powers. He knows he's unbreakable. He knows he's bulletproof. 
but they're going to learn that they can't shoot guns at him, so he's going to need to do different things with his powers. So it's nice to see some different stuff in this episode. And sorry, just on the gun thing, they explained it in, in episode one. Hey, dude, we've still got to try. Yeah, yeah. That explains the gun thing to me, which is, yeah, no one really believes it. Like, they're like, okay, well, I'm still going to try and shoot you with a gun to stop yeah. you because... I think they're probably looking for a weak point. Maybe they think it's his skin that's bulletproof, but if they get a headshot in, yeah. it hits him in the ear, hits him, in, him the in the eye, eye. or something, maybe it'll kill him. Uh, maybe that's the way they're, they're trying to do it. But it does feel a bit odd that they're sent out all night to find Luke Cage and they didn't have a different plan when they did find him. <laughs> you know, they do spend about eight or nine hours looking for him. So, uh, John, you had another point about Yeah, this I think one. one last thing, and it's just coming back to what Chris said about Piranha being, you know, maybe more legitimate. Like, I think actually Piranha is legitimate. Um, but he, he kind of passes off the insider trading to say that, well, all the big boys on Wall Street do it, which is probably exactly right. I think ultimately Piranha he comes from maybe dodginess, um, but he's doing legitimate stockbroking. Yeah. Um, he talks about these loopholes that white people do, which are legal, you know, in terms of saving their tax, getting rich quick. And he just says, I'm just doing that for, for my fellow brethren. Yeah. Uh, effectively. Yeah. And I, I really enjoyed that. It's kind of a nice little critique about, um, you know, it seems dodgy if one person does it, but actually there are legitimate forms of that. Um, were, you know, civilized society potentially deemed that to be like fine and, and, and okay. So yeah, I, I really like that little social critique there as absolutely. well uh, okay. from, from Piranha. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the stock market is basically just gambling. That's all it is. Exactly. Yeah, gambling is legal hey. everywhere in America. And that's all the stock market is. You know, we saw this week, Amazon announcing that they're going to be dealing with local businesses has taken $13 billion off five companies just by an announcement because it's all gambling. That's all it is. I love the book that Piranha's father has left, him, which is effectively why do, why do white guys have all the fun? That's uh, that's about all the risks that white guys take on the stock market. Why don't you take them and, and live your life and make your money? That's that's where Piranha's gotten all his money from, just that inspiration. So uh, really yeah, good. exactly. Let's get on to bullet point two, guys. We've spent a lot of time on our first bullet point. Um, Anansi is challenging... Bushmaster here. I, yeah. I kind of like this moment. Like, Anansi is an older man. We found out in the previous episode that he is his uncle, so it does seem like he's much more knowledgeable. I do love the moment that he stands up to Bushmaster and says to him, the day that I'm afraid to give my opinion to anybody, even you, is not a day that's going to come. Uh, I think that's a really important moment. Having Anansi being the head of the family in New York with Bushmaster, the young upstart, making these decisions is a really interesting challenge that Anansi has to deal with. Anansi's saying to Bushmaster that you can't do this kind of stuff because it reflects badly on our society as Jamaicans. He's effectively saying to him, like things like an attack on 9-11, reflecting on an entire society and people being looked at differently from that point onwards. That's effectively what Anansi's saying to him. He's going, you're, you're now becoming a terrorist. You're not becoming a representative of the Yardies in New York. You're not making our gang look really powerful. You're making us look like terrorists. And it's a really interesting discussion to have, I thought. Yeah, but I think the, they're still at odds with one another. You know, he gets this speech from Anansi and ultimately Bushmaster says, this is war and I'm following through with it no matter how it looks. And um, he is absolutely focused on this, but I do like this, this kind of fracture between Bushmaster and Anansi mm -hmm. in, in that you know, Anansi is as much of the stylers or the Yardie gang as, as Bushmaster, but he would just do it in a different way. And actually, I think maybe more so he's looking at the entire Jamaican community, not just the gang community. Mm -hmm. uh, and ultimately, you know, what Bushmaster has done in making the statement with the, the heads on a spike plus the attack on the party is, is that that goes beyond what they should be doing. Um, and it really then is going to reflect on people who have traveled from Jamaica, settled in America, making their lives here and how society may then push back against these people because of the actions of, of Bushmaster. So, it's, I mean, it's also very pertinent in uh, politics uh, across the world in America, in Europe, this idea of migration and how new uh, arrivals are viewed and um, what happens when they do arrive. So um, it, it, again, it's a, it's a nice little, 
uh, social political point being uh, brought up here in the same way that Piranha made uh, of sort of the financial system. And so, uh, again, you know, Hadari Koka does absolutely interweave socio-political aspects into these tales. Uh, and they're done really nicely because they don't become preachy. Uh, they become part of the story. Uh, and I think it really resonates. So, I, yeah, I really enjoyed this this moment in Gwen's restaurant. I, I see both your points. I see the rationale for it. We've already heard of Nancy's talk to Bushmaster about taking too much of the nightshade. Mm-hmm. And he was like, no man should do this, blah, 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 blah. Now we they have at odds against the, obviously the way that he's John is controlling the Ardies. Um so I think what we'll end up having is Bushmaster going slightly crazy, if you will, and, and Nancy pulling his support fully. Yeah. And it's kind of like I need more power because uh, he's gonna need more power to take on Luke Cage. So Probably what that will come down to is like him, him needing more nightshade, him needing more support and more knowledge, and Anansi taking going. No, you 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 made this bed, you lie in it type of thing. That's where I hope it goes to something like that. I don't know whether he's in control of the nightshade. I think it just will genuinely be we have Bushmaster going on this personal crusade against the Dillards or. Stokes, obviously. And by going on a personal crusade, it means he's not leading the Yardies. He's going on his own crusade. He's doing things that the Yardies wouldn't do. So therefore, he's not a gang leader. He's a man on a mission. He's one man against the Stokes. So I think it'll be more that. I think he'll pull the support. He'll get the Yardies back underneath another leader. uh, And Bushmaster will be cut off and left to fight this fight alone. Okay, well, even if that's that, I'm okay with that. But we do know, Nancy, there was some, some connection that he taught John. It, ha- it had nothing to do with the magic. It's it's to do with the inspiration that he's given to him, that you lie in wait until you can take down the person on top of the hill. That's all that Anansi's done. He's given him the stories and the history and the encouragement to get to where he is now. And he's now the leader of the Yardies, but there's no connection to the magic side of things or the um, the development of him. He knows about it. He's the one that told him to go to mm. uh, Mariah's daughter's Tilda's place to get the stuff. He's aware of it and knows about it, but it's not its not anything he can take away or imbue him with. Yeah, no, I was more going for he's the one who... Yeah, he knows the recipes or something. He, like, yeah, he he, has I think history. he taught he taught John the, the, the recipes. I thought that, that was what I got. But again, but, yeah. we still don't know for sure. So anyway, moving on from that. Um, does anyone want to do anything else uh, on point two? No, I think we're good to go on to point three. Okay. So, Shades and Comanche go on the offensive. Yeah. Yeah, the the boys are fully the back in town, if you want to call it that. I have to say, I really like that scene in um, Harlem's Paradise when they're kind of setting up the troops to be on either end of the of the place like it's the OK Corral. I think even Comanche says that uh, you've got the team on either side of the building blocking it in case a full-on war is going to come down. And really like that moment uh, with Shays. And then we also find out he's done the proper thing you do in business if you sell your entire gun business. You keep all the good stuff for yourself, right? Yeah. <laughs> so we have that We have that great hidden gun uh, rack that's in the in the basement of, uh, of Harlem's Paradise full of every type of gun you could possibly imagine. That's really cool as they go into tulip for the fight ahead. And then unfortunately... They effectively take all of these guns and just go and sit in pops for about six or seven hours, um, chatting, waiting for Luke to arrive home. Yeah, it was a bit like, okay. I want to see you shoot those guns, yeah. But they did have one of the six barrel shotguns. Yes, they did. They did, yeah. But I mean, we actually get a completely different turn of events here, which I think is quite unexpected. Um, you know, in, in the sense that Comanche here declares himself for, for shades, mm-hmm. you know, that they're, they're talking about their situation. Um, and obviously they had this intimate relationship, uh, in prison. Mm-hmm. Um, and that Comanche still has those feelings, you know, that in coming out of prison, uh, he hasn't changed. Um, whereas Shades sees it very much as some kind of necessity whilst in prison. Otherwise you would go crazy, but w- still ultimately has his, his, his back for, for Comanche. Um, and I really, I really like this in the sense that firstly, absolutely unexpected turn of conversation. I wasn't expecting this at all. And it 
immediately throws Comanche into like a really different light within yeah. within this show. Uh, you know, we've seen him with Ridden Hour, we've seen him uh, obviously with with Shades, uh, you know, and you think he's this brute and all of a sudden there is a much more nuanced uh, character here uh, with a number of different levels. Yes, he's a gangster. Yes, he knows certainly about stocks and shares from his time in prison, but we also see here someone uh, very intimate uh, and intimate here, in this case, with Shades. So I, I found this really um, a fantastic little turn, actually, uh, in Comanche. Uh, so very unexpected. And I think ultimately it may play out uh, much bigger moving down the line because we we see here that Mariah in sort of seeking protection at the um, NYPD and with Ridenauer, we, we definitely see her clock the fact that Ridenauer in a sense uh, slips up. He, he is really specific about uh, one of Cottonmouth's killings in season one, that of Tone, where he, I think, gouges his eyes out and then throws him off the top of a building onto a car. Mm. But he's so specific that Mariah really clocks this. And ultimately, she asks Shades uh, about Tone and his death and who knew about his death at the hands of Cornell. And, and Shades says, no one, just me um, and two other guys. So, you know, is Shays protecting he, uh, here Comanche? And ultimately, given that Mariah now is suspicious that there is a snitch in uh, Harlem's paradise, will that heat fall back onto Shays because he's protected Comanche? Or will she ultimately go straight for Comanche because she's had that pretty um, difficult or testing relationship with him uh, because he challenges her? Yeah. And ultimately, how will that play into that conversation that the two of them had in Pops, mm -hmm. in, in the quiet intimacy of potentially being um, attacked by the Jamaican gangs uh, and holding their weapons? So I really liked this. I really did. Um, I, I thought this was pretty neat and very unexpected. Yeah, I, I think it's really important how this plays out in the show. Um, I, I think it's an interesting twist and a nice, a nice little turn in there, and it makes a lot of sense now why Comanche has been pushing Shades to take over from Mariah. He's completely got his back and completely believes in them because they have this kind of relationship that they've had in the past. So as long as it comes back in future and as long as it's not just a throwaway line to add some depth to the character, if that's all it is, probably not, not going for it. Um, Let's get a bit more depth and a bit more detail and a bit more impact on the show in future episodes. I think it's really important. There's a famous moment, if anybody remembers it, from The Wire, where one of the major characters out of nowhere is sitting in a gay bar having a drink. And the actor himself, to this day, still has no idea and still had no idea that was coming up in the show. So never played the character any other way other than the way he thought his character was. And then suddenly he appears in a gay bar out of nowhere. Um if that's what this is, if this is just one of those moments that's put in there to add a little bit of depth to the character and add a little bit of interest, I'm not I'm not going for it. Give some more to the character in the future. I really want to see this really play into the relationship between Shades, Mariah, and Comanche. It should be important and should be founded there. I think you're right, though, John. That, that, that moment where Shades says to Mariah, nobody else was there except everybody who's dead, that is Mariah going, well, then it must be you then you must be the one that shared this piece of information. If you're the only person alive and nobody else is there and you always tell me the truth, then it's got to be you, right? So it's definitely throwing some shade on shades. Yeah, and I, I think certainly just quickly because, you know, earlier in the episode, I think Mariah has that moment where she goes, my biggest enemy is the only one I can trust. I mean, there is a suddenly a breakdown in trust that she is having here with shades as much as anyone else uh in Harlem. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, because Luke has got Piranha, she is like, they're going, he, my biggest enemy is the only one I can trust to keep Piranha safe so that all this doesn't implode and I don't lose everything. So, I mean, she is massively distrustful and suspicious at the moment. I'm in agreement with both of you. When it comes to these types of moments, typically back in the day, they used to be big surprise announcements, things like that. It's amazing that in today, in, in 2018, in some of these shows, it's just, no, this character is gay. It's not a big thing. 
as long as it feeds the character, as you say, Derek. Yeah. If this is just a kind of passing thing and we never see here it again, I'm with you on this. That I'm not happy. Yeah. Uh, I, it needs to be explored and how that feeds into Shades more Comanche as a whole because of this leak being found out. I th- I'm hoping we get some sort of sacrifice or something dying deathbed, like a bullet coming for Shades. And what we end up getting is Comanche diving in front of it. Shades going, what the hell did you do that for? And he goes, I loved you, man. Something along those lines. Like, cause then it is, he actually did truly love him. Like, there's like, no, I actually loved you. Blah, blah, blah. You were always, if we get that. Then there's an emotional connection. It's going to be good. Even Comanche dying and on a deathbed and saying some form of that, I think is, is what we, we need. I, I, can I just interject here? Cause I don't, no, if I agree with that. That's um, allowed. That is allowed. Yes, that can happen. Absolutely. But why should we not believe that he means that in that conversation that he has in the barbershop? Absolutely, John. I totally agree with you. He is saying that the J- Jamaicans could break in right now and one of them could be dead. So he is saying to him, this could be my deathbed moment. That's why I'm revealing to you that I still have these feelings. That is me. It wasn't just something for prison. It's not just an inside thing. This is me. This is the real me. He said that to him now. But I do think it has to play out later in the series, just purely in the fact that, as you say, Chris, potentially Comanche having to protect Shades from Mariah because of this whole discovery that that Mariah is making at the moment. Potentially it's just that. Or he's the one that kills Mariah to protect Shades. Potentially something like that happening in future could be interesting. I thought the discussion between Comanche and Shades about why Shades is with Mariah was quite interesting as well. Yeah. This is, he never says he loves her. He never says she's amazing in bed or anything like that. He says the reason he does it, does it is because, well, she's the one that took a cottonmouth. That's a huge reveal to Comanche as well. He's in the pocket of a, of the captain of the police, remember? So Shades has just told him the big secret. Mariah's the one that killed Cottonmouth on purpose because he was getting too big for his boots. So effectively, what Shades is, t- is telling Comanche is he's attracted to power. He's gone for Mariah because she's the most powerful person he's ever met, which I think is quite interesting. I agree with you. It, it is interesting. I don't know. I, I still think there's so, mu- there's so much more and to happen with this relationship, this triangle, and just the depth in general is amazing. Like, it's one of the reasons I love the Netflix shows. They either do relationships really well or sometimes really shallowly. So this is one of these deep, and filled relationships where you were kind of like scraping layers off and we're finding more information and you're going, does, so does he actually love her? Does he not? Because later on, when Shades is with her, I do get the sense that, like, from the actor, Theo Rossi, I get the sense that he loves her. Now, yeah. I know he's an actor and I'm supposed to get that, but Shades is of not course. an actor. So I'm like, oh, wait, wait, I don't... I just don't... Now do I believe Shades there? Or do I believe Shades... Back in the barbershop. That mm-hmm. is the question. Oh, no, he's not. I'm not saying he doesn't love her. I'm saying that the reason they got together was because she's willing to make the moves that nobody else would make. That's what I find interesting. And same thing in the episode, John, you mentioned it. her henchman, Alex, when she's talking to him, she effectively says she doesn't trust Shades at all anymore. Mm. He could jump off a building. She doesn't care because he hasn't been there when she needs him to be there. Like, that's really important. She's effectively breaking up with him in, in her mind. So quite an interesting one. I think there's lots more to be seen from these characters in the future. And I hope it doesn't end in a, in a two minute scene next episode. I want this to be the rest of their relationship for the rest of the series for as long as they all, all three of them are alive. Uh, let's get on to bullet point number four, guys. I think uh, it's time to talk about Misty under the microscope. Yeah, I, I discussed in the last episode, I wasn't too happy with how they had taken her character in terms of the they would broken her character to me slightly in terms of her being willing to potentially plant evidence going against her like her own sense of code um they've made it up in this episode i feel okay because and i i i think that could be because it's not one single writer or it, you do have multiple writers the last episode was that person's attention and then the showrunner's supposed to thread it all together but the last the last per the last writer made a decision, and then this writer is kind of like, no, okay, well, based on that, my version of Misty kind of will feel more morally bad about this. So I okay. I like that they kind of took what I consider Misty, which is she's struggling 
with the thought that she even was about to. And I think that's enough. So getting to see her admit to being in the apartment with Cockroach about to plant evidence. Mm -hmm. Having her being dressed down by uh, Ridenour. Getting like, it's just everything about this last couple of scenes with this felt like the Misty I, I, I enjoyed. Yeah, and she on, she would only feel like that by going through that moment, Chris. So that, that's kind of the point. I don't want to go over the same conversation on this episode because we didn't agree on this point last time. What I find interesting is that Misty says something that is a lie to punish herself in front of Ridden Air. She's a cop. She wants to be a cop. And to punish herself in front of Ridden Air, she says, I was going to plant the evidence until I saw the corpse. And that's not what happened. She was going to plant the evidence. She held back, put it back in her po- pocket, and then saw the corpse. So she's absolutely admitting to something that she didn't do to punish herself again. She's still on a little bit of that downward spiral again. She still feels like she shouldn't be a cop because she was going to do what Scarf was going to do. She feels like it's all having an impact on her and she's becoming the cop she doesn't want to be and that's why she wants to leave. But she didn't do it. She doesn't want to stress again what we said last week. She did not plant the evidence. She decided not to. She was going to when she got there, but she decided not to before she saw the body. And this time she cops to doing something differently. So I think that's just punishment from from Misty. And again, you're right, Chris, that is absolutely one of the parts of Misty's character. She feels that she should be good for good's sake all the time. This conversation she has with her psychologist is quite interesting where she asks him, is it right to ever do bad to accomplish something good? And he just kind of looks at her and goes, you've answered your own question. Doing something bad to do something good is doing something bad, right? Yeah. So uh, I think that's really interesting. I like that they brought uh, Gabe Krasner, her doctor from season one, back into this episode. It's quite interesting that she would call him up. You know, she does need to lean on some people, and it's nice that she has her own support structure. What these scenes with Misty really tell me six episodes into the season is it's not just Luke Cage this season. It is Luke Cage and Misty Knight. They're, they're giving as much depth to her character as they are to his. I agree with you. I think the great thing here about Misty... Um, is, you know, she says it to Ridenour herself. Um, it's what I was saying. She is on that edge of what does she do as a cop where she wants to get results. She mm-hmm. wants to put cockroach behind bars. She's not been able to do it. And, and she says it to Ridenour. She goes, you know, I do as I do effectively and nothing will happen. We won't get convictions. We won't get these, these people taken off the streets or, or justice brought to serve mm-hmm. or, I do as as what Scarf did, and I, I start to be a dodgy cop, and that's not what I want to be. Um, she doesn't want to do that, and that's why she hands in her badge, ultimately. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's really what we get here in her conversation. Um, yeah, I think I didn't quite understand why she gave a different story to Ridenour. Uh, maybe, as you say, yeah, it's to just to really beat herself up, or mm-hmm. maybe, again, she's questioning... Did she see the body after she had put the the bullet in her coat and had made that decision not to plant it? But ultimately, this is where she's at. And I think then with with Gabe Krasner, this is taken further in that he gives her that advice to say what you need to try and discover is who you are, not what everyone else wants you to be, not the Private Ryan of the NYPD, uh, not the Luke Cage um, supporter against all the odds and, and, and the cost of that to your career. Who is Misty Knight? What do you want to do? Mm-hmm. And how do you want to do it? Um, and I think that was absolutely fantastic that she had that talk with uh, Krasner. Yeah. Yeah. So guys, I, I, riddle me this, because I'm not a smart man, I say. But I'm, <laughs> I'm not the least smart either. Where is Misty right now? So he tells, Rittenhauer tells her to go home, don't come back until I call you. I took mm-hmm. that as, well, you're not fired, but you're, like, you're suspended. Then Misty comes back, she hands in the good and ba- gun and badge, typical cop show piece, I'm off the force, I can't do this anymore, kind of. Thing and he, but he goes, I can't accept that. Mm-hmm. So, is she suspended? Has she quit? Are we getting Detective Misty? Like, or are we still going to get Police Chief Misty? By the okay. end of this episode, I was confused of, is she actually suspended? Is she still a cop? Has she quit quit? Because they don't resolve those scenes well enough, I don't think. 
Uh, well, look, it's episode six. We've got we've got seven more episodes to go, so they don't have to resolve everything in every episode. I don't I don't see that's the case. I thought there was something more formal about what Ridden Arrow was saying to her. I think he was just saying, get out of my face, Misty. Um, she's standing over trying to interview Mariah, which is what Ridden Arrow was going to do. She's annoying the hell out of him with that. So he's kind of like, get out of my face and don't come back until I call you. I don't think it's an official dressing down or suspension by any means that he would have to make something much more formal for it to be an official suspension. And the fact that he has said in the past she's the Private Ryan of the police force he probably can't suspend her. He's probably under orders not to suspend her from, from the police force. So I think he's just saying get out of my face to begin with. Where we are at the end of the episode is Misty has decided not to be a cop anymore because she believes, as John said, that there's only two paths for if she stays a cop and she can't get results and she can't stay good. So she has decided to leave. She's handing over her badge and gun. And whether Ridden Air accepts that or not, it doesn't matter to Misty. She's walking out and going, I'm no longer a cop. You have all the things that make me a cop right there on the table. Yeah, I think Ridden Arrow kind of says, I can't take those. Um, you know, he doesn't want her to, to go because I think ultimately, yes, he's given her a hard time. He sees that she is going beyond her remit mm-hmm. uh, and he has to challenge her for that uh, as uh, the captain of the, the precinct. Um, but he does recognize her qualities uh, as a detective. And so I think when she hands the gun and the badge over, um, I think it's more that he's saying, look, I can't take these. Don't do this to me um, effectively. Yeah. Uh, he realizes that this would be um, a big blow. And yeah, maybe there's some of that um, higher management element where they've said, sh- you know, she is the the poster woman for the nypd given what happened to her so um but i think ultimately yes i think she has uh left the nypd and the harlem precinct okay cool I, i'm sorry Derek. i wasn't asking for it to be resolved by the end of the episode i was talking about the resolution of the scene hmm. it just felt like it was too an abrupt cut in terms of like how the scene played out it didn't, but it felt like the editor literally just went, ah, and scene, and just like cut to that point. Right. That's kind of where I was more going like, oh, no, no, like, give me something. Okay. I didn't, I didn't think there was much more to say really in the scenes. She puts the gun and badge on the table and goes on out and, and leaves. So that's kind of Exactly. I now understand it, so I, I'm now with you guys in terms of, okay, yeah, it sounds mm-hmm. like she's out. Okay. From one person out to two men on a bridge. I, can't, I, I couldn't think of a better segue, people. I'm very sorry. On to bullet point number five. The battle of the bridge. The battle of two big men. Mm-hmm. Yes. And as I mentioned earlier on, what a big cheater our Bushmaster is. Uh, we have Luke calling him out, telling him to come down for a battle to end all battles. Me and you, mano a mano, fists versus fists, kicks versus kicks. Let's see who wins this one. Um, yeah, yeah. I think as a Bushmaster, he's obviously a good boy scout he has come prepared and he's not cheating he's just prepared he's he's got his plan b his fallback plan if it goes wrong he's he's fighting smart Um, which is what luke has always said you need to do is is fight smart all credit to to bushmaster but i i I love this i love the that kind of powder into the face uh you know proper old school um, magic, you know, the magic dust, mm-hmm. um, the the fairy dust or, or whatever it might be. And then, um, okay, we get a little exposition heavy uh, with uh, your paralyzed now. Yes, I think we definitely saw that he had turned into a statue. Um, <laughs> that really did make me laugh because it really did feel like a moment from a comic book because you have to do that in comics. You have to have the speech balloon that says you're paralyzed now, Luke, because you can't tell from a non-moving image. You can't tell that he's paralyzed. He looks exactly like he did in the previous in the previous panel. So uh, you do have to have that in the comic books. But it just made me laugh to have to have Bushmaster say that in a live action moment when you see him being a statue on the bridge. It did feel a bit cheesy super villain <laughs> i loved it but i did full-on laugh yeah, out loud. exactly exactly for every single gritty realistic thing we praise this show for and these shows for every now and again you just go really <laughs> okay 
I'll roll exactly, with it. It's exactly. fun. Like it's still based on a comic book. I still think that was just in there. I know they know exactly how this looks as well. You know, they've seen the episodes ten times more than we have before they're released, you know, so they could have cut the line, but I think they're doing it as a little a little throwback to the comic books. I think it was I think it was funny. Just quickly, before we go any further, I just want to point out for definite here, Luke battling Bushmaster on the bridge. Again, mano a mano, fists versus fists, kicks versus kicks versus punches. Luke wins. So Luke is the one that wins this fight. He could have killed Bushmaster. You see Bushmaster with a gash in his cheek, blood pouring out of him. So Luke is the one that wins this fight, and that's why Bushmaster goes after him with the with the powder. So just want to make sure we give a bit of credit to Luke. You know, he's he's been beaten up by this guy before, but he is still stronger than him now. So I wonder if this is something about the nightshade wearing off potentially or something like that yeah but i mean that kick into the river if he's paralyzed and he um is as heavy as a lead balloon then who is going to be his samwise ganji that pulls him uh frodo baggins like out of uh out of that river (laughs) who is there yeah nice pull we've watched lord of the rings quite a lot recently i think (laughs) yeah i was gonna go oh that was i was trying to rack my head about like a way of explaining that. And I was like, oh, yeah, okay. Mm, okay. Remember I was saying earlier, we're going to, with, with a Nancy, Bushmaster is going to come back and go, I need to get more powerful. Mm-hmm. This is going to be this point. Because you're right, Luke pretty much wins. Bar from a bit of secret herbs and spices, he would have yeah. won. Yeah. Someone has to save Luke. It's not going to be Claire. Potentially D-Dub. Let's see. I'm I'm not even sure. I'm wondering whether the water may wash off the powder off his face and he wakes up. Maybe it doesn't have as big an effect on Luke as it does on other people because of Luke's super strength. You know, could be something like that. We don't know yet because that's where it ends is as he falls to the bottom of the river uh, after yeah, being kicked in and paralyzed. So one one question I did have for you: mm-hmm. Who the hell was the boy that the Jamaicans were talking to that calls his mother? I have that in notes, Chris. So don't worry, got you covered. Uh, if we want to um, move on to notes, I can yeah. absolutely go into this. I think that's a perfect excuse. Gentlemen, let's uh, move on. Yes. Um, the kid that the Jamaicans are talking to is Lonnie uh, from season one. I, th- I think it's a point that I was actually making to John after watching this episode. It's one of those weird things with season two of this show being almost two years after season one. If you didn't watch all of season one directly before season two started, there's a couple of characters here that you may not notice. Uh, for example, Gabe Krasner, as we mentioned earlier on, um, he was in season one. He was the psychologist who was dealing with Misty's issues. He's play, played by John Skirty from Rescue Me, uh, probably one of his biggest roles. Um, I recognized him immediately and knew he was in season one because I know him from Rescue Me, but you may not have known who this character was, and they give you no exposition as to who he was at all. Lonnie's another one of those characters. Lonnie was in five episodes of season one of Luke Cage. He was the kid who was going to college and studying. Uh, his mom was pushing him onto her career to become a lawyer. Uh, she was a lawyer. He was saved by Luke in the barbershop when it was under attack uh, from Shades, I think, was the, we was shooting up the entire place back in back in season one. But there was no explanation. It was just, honestly, because his subtitles were subtitled with the word Lonnie that I went, oh yeah, that's who he is from season one. Because he's grown up. It's been two years, you know? <laughs> um, so it's a bit difficult. Uh, I know it works for other shows. Like we were saying before, if you watch a show like Gotham, which is 22 episode seasons, and there's only a gap of about four or five months. If a person that appeared in one episode of season one in Gotham appears in one episode of season four, I'm going to know that character immediately. But because there's such a long gap on these shows in Netflix, sometimes they just kind of disappear. You, you, you can't pick them up immediately. Yeah? Yeah. I kind of pride myself on knowing these characters. Uh-huh. And I even went, who the hell is that? Are they introducing a new character? And is that how they introduce it? <laughs> this kid randomly out of nowhere calls his mum. And says, don't tell aunt, not, auntie not to come outside because the streets yeah. are hot. Anyway, thank you for explaining that. Yeah, I think it's just that. I think it's just they will use a character from season one to give a little bit of ex- exposition because, well, it just shows you he still exists in the environment and still exists in the area. So we may not see him back in the rest of the season. But again, this would absolutely jump out to you if you just saw him four or five episodes ago in, in season one. One other reference that I absolutely love in this episode, because I've mentioned it before on some of our uh, Defenders podcasts, because... This movie gets referenced quite a lot by the Defenders. The Warriors once again referenced at the beginning of this episode when we have Sheldon outside calling for Mr. Cage with the three bottles on his fingers, clanking them together. That's exactly how the Warriors come out to play scene is played out within the Warriors. Um, The 1977 movie, uh, which I reference all the time. If you like New York, if you like the Defenders and you haven't seen the Warriors, go watch it. And they're rebooting it as we speak. As a TV series, I believe, yeah. 
The Warriors TV series, by the way, is uh, being written by the Russo brothers. So that's why it's also quite important and interesting for Marvel fans. Interesting. I trust them. I trust them. Uh huh. And just another one because we paused it. Had to had to check out what uh, Piranha was referencing when he looked at his phone and said the British press don't hold back, do they? Uh, the reason why he was saying that was because their headline of what happened at uh, Mariah's opening was "Heads Roll at Building Opening," uh, being the uh, the tabloid headline for the attack on Mariah's opening. So heads roll, much more clear and defined as to what happened uh, at that particular moment uh, than they, than you would have in the US press. Nice. Um, so the last one for me is, um, where's my money, honey? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I, I love this line. I thought it sounded so out of place that I was like, okay, it has to be something. Yeah. It is. So, sorry, by the way, I'm referencing Luke asking Prana, where's my money, honey? Just sounded so out of place. So I went looking... Luke Cage, Hero for Hire, issue number nine. Luke goes to Doctor Doom, of all people, and actually asks, where's my money, honey? In relation to a paltry, as Doctor Doom says, $200 that he owed Luke because he hired Luke to track down some of his robots. <laughs> I kid you not. I love it. I love it. One, wonderful Doctor Doom, though. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. but you're right. It's, it's one of those ones, again, when you have those kind of lines in this in this show, it absolutely stands out. You know they've taken it from somewhere. What a great place to take it from, though. <laughs> also really good to see WJBP TV back, the uh, anchor woman who's been on all of the Netflix shows. Um, really cool to see that they're continuing that continuity with her. She's, I think she's probably appeared in more episodes than Claire Temple at this stage. <laughs> <laughs> she has. Yeah. Uh, for th- our listeners who aren't quite sure, if you're just joining us because we haven't talked about WJBP TV this season, uh, it is the local kind of Hell's Kitchen TV sta- news station that has been in every season at least once of the Netflix Defender shows. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. So it's good to see her back. Good to know that she's still alive. She's taking along with Avengers Affinity War coming up. Who knows? <laughs> Absolutely. So, gentlemen, I think with that, it's time to move on to our defense. John, do you defend Luke Cage Season 2, Episode 6, The Basement? Yes, I do defend this episode of Luke Cage. Yeah, I give this for Colonel's Secret Powder Puff Recipes out of five <laughs> um yeah i i really enjoyed this i i thought it was um really characterization heavy but i liked that i really enjoyed piranha and, and luke together i love the two fights around him protecting um piranha as his hero for hire that he didn't quite um understand what hero for hire meant you know for piranha it was that he would get him to safety to his jet so he could fly away and um, for luke it was to get him to the cops which piranha kind of didn't really uh dig that i really like that they unexpectedly bonded over their own relationship with their father i thought that was really quite nice i really uh like the unexpected um, development in Comanche as well. I, I thought it was uh, really good. And I think given what happened here with Mariah at the police station and her conversation with Shades, uh, it really will flow uh, into that storyline, this this trio of characters at Harlem's Paradise. And I'm really looking forward to that. Um, and then the big fight on the bridge at the end, along with then Misty uh, and Ridenour and her handing in the badge and her really making this move to either PI Misty or possibly to Daughters of the Dragon Misty. Really, really good. Um, I really can't wait to see her kind of hook up with Luke uh, as another strong person on the streets of Harlem. So, yeah, absolutely defend uh, this episode. Chris, do you defend this episode of Luke Cage? I do defend it. As you said, it was very much character development heavy. Um, we get a beautiful fight at the beginning. That is my up. That's my coming down. We, As I just discussed earlier, we got a lot of character development, which slowed the pace quite a lot. Um, but then towards the end, literally we get that beautiful fight scene. Um, and I was really happy with it. So that was my kind of up, come up again. Um, so if I was a Luke Cage addict, this would be my, my second hit. <laughs> um, I want to see where it goes. Mm-hmm. 
um, they have to ensure that Comanche's confession goes somewhere. They have to make sure that Misty's confession and subsequent quitting go somewhere. And I'm not sure they will. And that's kind of it. So, yes, I defend not not nearly as strongly as I do previously mm-hmm. in the previous episodes. I think that's okay. I'm used to these shows taking a dip midpoint. Like, not full dips. This is, a, if, you, if you think in terms of what we've gotten, episodes one to five, this is slightly less. Okay. It's basically tripoded by three great fight scenes. <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm not. I'm not. A, I'm a yes to defend, but not a hundred percent. And on that note, Derek, do you defend this episode? Good catch. Yeah, I think I'm uh, much more up on this episode than you, Chris. Actually, by by the sounds of things, um, we're exactly at the point in the series where we need an episode like this to give us some things to to have to talk about on the show for the next seven episodes. We're right in the middle of the season, so uh, one of the things you'd mentioned before, Chris, was that you felt like you knew where the story was going uh, early on in the season, and you didn't know how it would be able to stretch that out for the rest of the season. We've got loads of stuff here to play on. We've got the idea that Mariah is possibly now going after Shades. That's quite a huge idea now, that the, the breaking up of them. We've got the breaking up, possibly, of the Yardies. Uh, we've got Luke using new powers in this episode. That's really cool. Uh, nice to see that. And we've now had the showdown between our two big characters this season we've got bushmaster versus luke cage at the end of this episode so yeah some really really good stuff in here a high defend from me and leaving it on the cliffhanger of luke being paralyzed kicked into a river and about to drown what's going to happen we really want to know and i really want to go see that episode so yeah high defend from me fantastic well gentlemen i think it's time we went on to some feedback Cool. Jamie Young sends us her thoughts over on our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash Defenders TV podcast. She says, so much happens in this episode. I don't even know where to start. Shades and Comanche's conversation in the barbershop is heartbreaking and adds an extra layer to Comanche's distaste for Mariah. He has been reluctant to betray Shades to Ridnair, but I wonder if that will change. Is it just me or is Mariah's alcohol consumption reaching Jessica Jones proportions? <laughs> well, it should be Vodka Watch, to be honest. Absolutely. And to be honest, that is quite easy because she is most certainly um, enjoying her Belvedere vodka. She certainly is. And pretty much everything else from the top shelf yeah. <laughs> in there. Yeah, that, that we talked about Shades and Comanche's conversation. Yeah, really, really heartbreaking, really interesting. Um, I'm not too sure how, what way it's going to play out, uh, depending on how it's going to be played into the show. Hopefully it gets, it gets played well, as we mentioned earlier on. Yeah, Jamie goes on to say, I know Piranha is an obnoxious tool, but I kind of like him. I completely (laughs) agree with you. I must say, I enjoyed seeing this other side of Piranha. He's still a baddie, but he's kind of a funny baddie, Yes, to be honest. He's a lot of fun in this episode, definitely. Um, Jamie goes on, I was distrustful of Luke's father, but now I'm starting to think he may be sincere in his efforts to reconcile with Luke. I hope we get a heart-to-heart between them soon. I love the line Bushmaster says to Luke on the bridge. I'm not interested in anything cheap. Revenge is expensive. Mm -hmm. He doesn't care if he destroys himself as long as he also destroys his enemies, which makes him especially dangerous. I'm really loving him as a villain and a character. We're definitely getting the cliffhangers this time around. Luke paralyzed at the bottom of Harlem River... Yes, Netflix, I am still watching. Yeah. <laughs> I think we all are, Jamie. Yeah, really good cliffhanger there. You know, this this solid bloke, paralyzed, uh, drowning. Uh, I think I said earlier, uh, who is going to be his Samwise Ganji to pull him out of the river? Or, ultimately, will he manage to plumb the depths of something somewhere and get himself out of that river? Uh, loving Bushmaster as well. He is a fantastic character. I absolutely love all his mannerisms, his motivation. uh, And I think just because his motivation is around the revenge against Mariah Stokes, and I love Mariah Stokes as well. These are two fascinating characters going head to head. And I suspect Bushmaster has the upper hand at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, loving 
his character. Yeah, absolutely. You've actually said something, Jamie, that I was trying to say and couldn't work out the words for. Uh, you've said that you were distrustful of Luke's father, but you're starting to think that he may be sincere in his efforts to reconcile with Luke. That's exactly how I feel. Uh, I started off the season kind of saying that he has a mask that he's covering up, that he's uh, speaking through this mask to other people so that they don't see the real him, that he's hiding himself. But you've hit the nail on the head. I do, I do feel at this stage that he's quite sincere in trying to reconcile with Luke. He's just not very good at it at the moment, I think is where, where we're seeing. So hopefully we'll see some more of the two of them together in the future. Yeah, thank you so much, Jamie, for that feedback. Now, gentlemen, I think it's time we wrap up. So with that, don't forget, you can get this episode and every following episode, subsequent episode, as we come along into the rest of Season 2 of Luke Cage over on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or any other good or evil, bullet-ridden or bulletproof podcast catcher around the world. Don't forget to share the love by sharing the podcast. And uh, yes, you can subscribe to all of us and follow along our conversations at DefendersTVPodcast.com. So gentlemen, I think that's it. We'll be back with our review of Luke Cage Season 2, Episode 7, on and on, on Tuesday. And yes, we're still on our regularly sh- scheduled programming of Friday and Tuesdays each week. Mm-hmm. I don't know about you lads, but I'm off to uh, peer over the bridge and see where Luke yes, is. definitely. Need to watch this episode. Looking forward to it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, everyone, so much for listening. Uh, We'll be back, yeah, next Tuesday to speak with you soon. Bye. Bye.